Me again. Hi, everybody. Um, we're on the final stage. I'm afraid to say that my fellow speaker, my colleague, Andrea, um, wasn't able to make the plane last night. So she's left responsibilities for both presentations to me. So you've got another whole half day of my talking. So um, I, you have my sympathy. <laughs> We're going to be talking about insurance. Um, we're going to start this morning by talking about um, IFRS 4, the existing standard of insurance. Now, Van and Christoph, when they spoke, they were talking largely about IFRS 4. They didn't really reference the new standard. And hopefully when we talk after T, what will be really interesting then, I hope, is we'll be able to start talking about how we address a lot of the issues that they've actually raised. And I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed their presentation. I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff in there. So much so that I've actually asked for a copy of the presentation, because I'd like to actually take that back and see if I can tick back off that presentation what hopefully we resolve with the new standard that's coming out. And we'll spend a little bit of time, as I say, after tea talking about that. IFRS 4 is maybe the oddest standard that exists in the, in the set of IFRS standards. And when I, when I get into it, you're going to see I'm going to talk for the first 15 minutes about just how odd it is. And then about halfway through the presentation, a little bit of normality comes in. But it really is a peculiar standard. As a starting point, um, IFRS 4 was applied to insurance standards. It applies to insurance standards. And this is maybe the most important thing about both IFRS 4 and um, the new standard that we're developing. Remember what we said all the way through, that w when we write standards, we write standards for transactions. We write standards for an activity. We don't write standards for companies. So IFRS 4 is not written for insurance companies. It's written for insurance contracts. That means sometimes companies that don't think they're insurers fall into the standard. And sometimes contracts that say insurance contract written on the top doesn't fall into this. Into this. So it's an odd thing because you actually have to decide where it applies and you have to go through the process of thinking about it. And in a moment I'll talk about what insurance actually is from the perspective of where we are. It includes both insurance and reinsurance. So reinsurance is simply an insurance contract that's sitting on the other side of my balance sheet. It has the same effect, it has the same process, it has the same thought process behind it. Um, it also includes obviously reinsurance contracts um, health, but it does not, doesn't address the other part of an insurer's balance sheet. So when Christoph, and, when Christoph was talking particularly here, they were talking about the fact that they've got assets and they've got liabilities and what happens with asset values and what happens with liabilities. And Werner's presentation with those squiggly lines like that was comparing what was happening with their assets and the liabilities. So the way insurers think about their business is an integrated asset liability business. The way we think about it is insurance contracts on one side, assets on the other side. And when we talk a little bit later, I'll just start telling you about how important it is that we try to make sure that the accounting for those two sides is consistent. So that we actually do get the, give them the ability to get that matching right. And some of the tools and things that we've developed and put in place for those um, to help people with that. So what is an insurance contract? Insurance contract is simple. One person accepts significant risk from another person, and that risk is something that would have adversely affected the policyholder. It's something that would have adversely affected someone. So very simply, I've got a house. If I insure my house, there's a risk that when that house burns down, I am adversely affected. It's bad for me that the house burned down. Okay? If I've, taken, if I've transferred that risk of my house burning down to somebody else, then that's an insurance contract. I've transferred an adverse event for me. If I insure your house, that's not an insurance contract. Because actually I'm not affected if your house burns. So that's the difference with an insurance contract. If I've done that, if I've insured your house, or I've insured all the houses in Philadelphia even though I live here, or all the houses in parts of Austria for flooding, that's not insurance anymore. What that actually is, is I'm taking a bet. I'm taking a bet that something will happen. So it's a derivative instrument. Now, there's lots of good reasons why I might do that kind of bet, but it's not insurance. And a lot of things like, for example, credit default swaps. What a credit default swap is, is it's something that says that in the event of a particular creditor failing, I, will, I the person who's issued the swap, will pay money to the person who's bought the swap. That feels like insurance. 
But when you look at the underlying part of the contract, the person who bought the swap can claim the money from me whether or not they lost anything. They might have sold the debt years ago. They might never even had the debt. They can claim the money from me. So there's no necessity for an adverse event in a credit default swap. So a credit default swap is not insurance. Okay. So these are the two things that you always have to have a look at. And again, this raises the point that sometimes things like credit default swaps, AIG, American Insurance Group, many years ago sold a lot of insurance default swaps. They were, doing, they were insuring all of those um, CDOs and vehicles that were out there. And for them, they considered what they were doing, insurance. But many of the people who bought that, um, and the Paulson Fund was one of them, were buying the credit default swaps, but they weren't buying the underlying. So American Insurance thought it was actually doing insurance, but it wasn't doing insurance. It was selling derivative instruments. So these are the kind of things that you need to look for when you get into the starting gate. And it means that when I'm thinking about insurance, when I'm thinking about what's an insurer's balance sheet, I have to accept that some things are going to be insurance and some things might not be insurance. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. So significant insurance risk, what does that actually mean? It means that at least in one scenario, and again the presentations we saw earlier had multiple scenarios, at least in one scenario, there must be a transfer of value from the insurer to the insured. Now thinking about short-term insurance, motor vehicle insurance, in most scenarios, people are not going to crash their cars. In most assumptions, in the one-year period that I have an insurance contract for my car, I don't expect to crash my car. Many of us around this room may never have crashed our car, not just in one policy, but in many. But there is a scenario, there is an assumption that you might crash a car. So there's at least one scenario, there's at least the likelihood you'll crash it. And let's face it, you wouldn't have taken the insurance in the first place if you didn't think you were going to crash. So if you have at least one scenario where you think you're going to make, it, make, a, uh, make a loss, at least one scenario where there'll be a significant transfer of value between the insurer and the insured, it counts as an insurance policy. It's not a percentage test, it just has to be one scenario, but the scenario must have commercial substance. So it can't be a scenario that says, aliens abducted me and hence I claimed. There's not a lot of commercial substance in alien abduction insurance. But these are the kind of things that you need to sort of play through, if you like, in terms of trying to decide. We do require that you unbundle deposits, and I'll talk through that in a few moments. And of course, you remember from yesterday when we talked about bifurcations and embedded derivatives and all of that, well, that comes back here, and we talk about that a little bit in the standard as well. So unbundling. Now, let me first talk about what unbundling is. Unbundling is another form of bifurcation. It's another form of taking the pair of scissors and cutting out a piece, of a, um, a piece of the contract from another piece of the contract. A lot of insurance contracts that you take have a guaranteed element, an amount that will be paid to you no matter what happens. Good times, bad times, you'll get it. That, that, whether you die, let's say, on a life policy, whether you surrender the policy, or whether you reach the age of 65 having not died or surrendered, you get paid out a certain amount. That's behaving very much like a deposit. It's like a savings account. I'm just putting money away every month, and at the end of five years, 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, I get the money back. That's what we would call a deposit component, the deposit element of it, because it's like a savings account. So the first part of the test is, can I measure what that deposit component is under IFRS 4? Okay. If I can measure it, I go on. If I can't measure it separately, I don't unbundle. So my first step is to test that to see whether I can. Now sometimes what you find is that the policy and the deposit component, the risk component and the deposit component, are so closely entwined that you can't separate it out. And in fact that happens more often than not with things like surrender values and the like, where they are so completely integrated into each other that you can't unbundle. And then you wouldn't unbundle. You move on to the next test, though. If you've now proved to yourself that you can measure it, you move on to the next test. And the next test is, under your current insurance accounting approach, can you recognize all the rights and obligations? So does your insurance accounting approach already recognize the, the obligations and rights of the deposit component? If the answer is yes, it's already measured, then you have a choice. You can decide if you want to unbundle or not. And when I get to the end of a couple of slides time, I'll tell you how all these choices have started to hurt us at the IFRS. On the other hand, if your rights and obligations are not recognized, so you're not seeing 
what's happening in the deposit while you're applying your insurance accounting, you're forced to, to, to unbundle. So you would have to unbundle under those circumstances. Now what we found here, um, and I think it was a little bit of what Vanna was touching on when he was looking at different countries. What insurers have done over the last 20, 25 years is that they've started to tailor products for specific jurisdictions. Tailor products because there's higher inflation or higher interest rate in those jurisdictions. Tailor products because there's more stable markets or less stable markets. And tailor products because of the accounting. So in Australia, they have tailored their product products so that they can unbundle everything. They like unbundling in Australia. In other jurisdictions, they've tailored their products so they don't unbundle. They don't like unbundling in other countries, so their products are tailored in, a, in that way. And as I say, when we talk after tea, we'll talk about how that different progression of products in different jurisdictions starts to affect the way you think about accounting and accounting changes. Embedded derivatives. Remember that IFRS 9, and for that matter, IS 39, requires that you strip out an embedded derivative and you fair value it. Particularly IS 39, uh, 39 required that you actually do this scissors thing. IFRS 4 continues that guidance, but in some circumstances it says you don't have to cut. In some circumstances it says you don't have to bifurcate. You don't have to bifurcate if the embedded derivative is itself an insurance contract. So sometimes you have... Um, uh, that an, an annuity type product that says what I do is I buy an annuity on day one, it will pay me a fixed amount for as long as I live. Okay. Here we have an insurance product. We have an insurance product because the insurer doesn't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know how long I'm going to live. So there's an uncertain future payment. I might get more than I put in or I might get less than I put in depending on how long I actually live. But in, in that product is an additional element which says that if I happen to die in the first 10 years, so I really lost out badly, I really bought the wrong product here because I died way too quickly, okay, then it will pay out a lump sum to my family. So I'll get an extra amount that comes out of it. Now if we're thinking in the way we thought about financial instruments yesterday, that feels like an embedded derivative. I have an insurance product, the annuity component, and then I have this extra thing which pays me extra if a different event happens. But that extra thing is just life policy. So it's another policy. So in effect, under IFRS 4, I wouldn't have to separate out the embedded derivative because the embedded derivative is simply another policy. It's another type of insurance. You also don't have to strip out um, an embedded option which is the option to surrender the contract for a fixed amount. That's a natural part of most insurance products, so you wouldn't have to, 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 to strip that out. So there's a couple of exemptions coming in here too, and as I mentioned, these things all start adding up under IFRS 4. Now, IFRS 4 was introduced, and I said when I started out that IFRS 4 is this like really peculiar standard. And if were best, the best way for me to describe IFRS 4 is it's not actually a standard, it's a framework for standards. It allows you to do a whole bunch of things. Now normally what we try to do with a standard is we try to tell you what to do. In IFRS 4, we saw the introduction of IFRS 4 as a temporary measure, okay, while we actually worked on the real standard, which is the one we're working on that we'll talk about a little bit later. Now temporary is an interesting word. Um, we started this project in 1997. We released IFRS 4 in about 2004 as a temporary measure. We're hoping the final standard will be available by, will be used, will go into production in 2018. So temporary is an interesting word in this circumstance. Anybody who's doing the maths behind the scenes will know that when we finally release, if we finally release the new standard and let it go on its own, it'll be 21 years old. So it would have earned the right to go out on its own. It'll be an adult, it can sort of go and do its own thing. But the problem with it is, and this is the problem we have whenever we de develop a temporary standard, is we've had a temporary thing in place while we developed a permanent thing. But the permanent thing has taken us so long that the temporary one has now become entrenched practice. So what does this tell Yes. Thank you. Uh, just because we have already passed that part of um, um, bundling of options and embedded um, deposit components, um, I would like to clarify for two examples. 
First, the simple option to give the uh, contract back and uh, get for the policyholder and receive the remainder of uh, premium given. Is it an embedded uh, deposit component or no? So that wouldn't be, that's one of the exemptions? Uh, so it would not be accounted for in any way? It would be accounted for as part of, and I, I, what I really enjoyed was the presentation that showed all those different scenarios that you model out. Um, when we were looking at the earlier presentations, one of those scenarios that you would model out is a lap scenario that you expect at some point in time the uh, insurer would walk, the, the policyholder would walk away, would take their money early so they wouldn't wait for the whole period. So that's one of the ways you would model your cash flows, but it's not a separate thing that you value under fair value. Remember the problem with embedded derivatives, you value embedded derivatives at fair value. Whereas for insurance accounting, you're modeling all your expected future cash flows and generally present valuing those cash flows today to get what you think your liability is. Now, one of those scenarios is an early payment. So the difference between two contracts in which one gives that option to the policyholder and the other does not give will be in technical reserves? It will be effectively accounted for either in the liability itself, so the liability of when I expect to pay out, or under technical reserves, and I'll get in a few seconds to what we talk about at technical reserves. IFRS 4 allows an awful lot of things to happen. But under the new accounting, under the, the, the new standard that we're su suggesting, it would be picked up probably in the actual cash flow calculations and the risk calculations you do on top of those cash flow calculations. Thank you. And another question regarding the reinsurance contracts, which are uh, denominated in foreign currencies. Uh, so if the foreign exchange rate changes, uh, the insurance sum will change. Uh, my question is, is that an option uh, embedded? That's not an option embedded, what you would do in that circumstance, although that's a very odd thing to do, because what you're effectively doing is introducing currency risk into your process. So you'd assume that you'd try and hedge it out to try and reduce the risk that you've got that. But let's assume that you've done that. What you would do is you would look first to measure the reinsurance contract, in its underlying currency. So you do all the measurements in the underlying currency, get a value at that, at the date, so let's say I'm now doing 31 December, I get the value in the underlying currency at 31 December, and then I'll convert that currency at that date to my... Um, not reporting, what's the other one? The currency I use? Functional currency. Functional currency. So I convert it to my functional currency at that point, and whatever the difference between the two is would be an additional profit or loss that I'd have to take. So I would end up recording, because remember what's going to happen now is that I might have started out, let's assume that my reinsurance asset stays exactly the same. It's 10,000 euros on day one, and it's 10,000 euros at the end of the year. But when I convert it, I convert it to pounds, and it was 9,000 pounds, and now it's 6,000 pounds. That's a loss. And yeah, but that. uh, that's, the, that's about the sum which is not in my balance sheet because that's the maximum uh, sum that a reinsurer would... I uh uh, No, what you would be doing is you'd be doing the valuation of the future cash flows. So you'd be determining what that value of your expected future cash flows is and bringing it back to today. So by valuing all my future cash flows, bringing them back to today, I'm determining a value. And that fu those future cash flows, it's a little bit like we talked about with impairment. There's a lot of similarities here between this and impairment. Bringing back those cash flows to today at a present value means that the cash flows, what I have to do in taking account of those cash flows is I have to take my expected future cash flows. So in much the same way as when I'm calculating the liability, I might look at a whole lot of different scenarios and probability weight each of those scenarios to get back to what I'm doing. Or I might have a thousand scenarios, each with um, the same probability, but that means that I'll have a cluster of scenarios about around the most likely scenario, the most likely outcome. I will do exactly the same for the assets. So I value the asset and the liability the same way. Okay, thank you. All right, so what we were saying, this is a temporary thing. The idea behind the temporary thing was introduce a standard that allowed you to um, carry on doing what you were doing previously while we developed a, a longer-term longer solution. That meant that IFRS 4 allowed a lot of insurers to do whatever insurers had been previously doing. So whatever the existing guidance was in the particular country you were in, you were allowed to continue with that existing guidance. 
That means to an extent the answers I've just given at the front here might be absolute nonsense in some jurisdictions. There might be some jurisdictions who've got a pure cost-based model. They don't update their cash flows. And because that was the way they were doing it before, they're allowed to keep doing it. Other jurisdictions might use a complete fair value model because we allowed you to do under IFRS 4 exactly what you'd been doing previously with a few, and I'll get to them in a few seconds, a few minutes, with a few caveats. But generally speaking, you just carried on doing what you'd been doing previously. And therefore, any judgments and estimates you were making were actually relevant to what you were doing previously, not relevant to what you're doing right now. Um, judgments and estimates, as we've just said now, the most important judgments and estimates that you make in insurance are about the uncertainty of future cash flows. You don't know what's going to happen. Most of the legwork that goes into calculating insurance numbers is about those uncertainty of numbers. The company that I used to work for, um, we had a banking subsidiary and I was in the banking subsidiary, but we also had a life insurer. And we always used to say that at year end when they ran their calculations to determine what their liability was, the lights in Johannesburg would go dim because there was so much computer power going into the calculations that they were doing. And they used to take them, they used to run those calculations for a month on high-end computers to actually get to the numbers they were talking about. So the uncertain cash flows are a very big deal in the insurance industry and modeling those different scenarios is one of the most important parts of it. So say, we decided to allow you to do whatever you were doing before. That meant we actually suspended the hierarchy in IS8. Now for those of you who, who might have remember hearing this on Monday, the hierarchy says that any accounting policy you de adopt needs to be relevant, it needs to be reliable, needs to be all of those things. You need to start by looking at uh, the standard in front of you. If the standard in front of you doesn't help you, you need to then look at any other standards we've written. Finally, you need to go to the conceptual framework. All of that stuff gets suspended for the purposes of insurance accounting. We don't do the normal stuff for insurance accounting. We allow you to do whatever you were previously doing, but you're not allowed to start doing something new if it fails the hierarchy. So I can continue my previous accounting, no problem, but I can't suddenly start doing something new if it's not relevant and reliable, or if it's not more relevant and more reliable than what I was doing previously. Um, so important there, this is the criteria used for developing accounting policies. You exempt from using those criteria, but you can't change policies unless it's to something more relevant and reliable. You may continue doing something, but you may not introduce something. We do, however, bring in a couple of things that we felt really were too difficult or too important not to change. Some existing practices that existed out there. The first one was we prohibit you from raising provisions for contracts that don't yet exist. So what sometimes used to happen in the past was that insurers in good years would put aside some of their profits so that if they happen to write bad contracts in the future, they would have some reserves to cover it. You're no longer allowed to do that under IFRS 4. Um, IFRS 4 does require insurers to keep insurance liabilities on the balance sheet until they discharge, cancelled or expired. So derecognition of liabilities, that continues to operate the way it normally would operate under the rest of IFRS. You can't offset your reinsurance assets with your insurance liabilities. You do have to test your in reinsurance assets for impairment. So if I've reinsured with a dodgy reinsurer, I have to check to see whether or not that asset needs to be impaired. If I have a policy that says I don't revalue, I don't update my assumptions on my reinsurance assets, I still need to see whether or not those assumptions have got so negative that actually I've impaired the asset. The asset is now on my balance sheet too high a value. And I have to have a liability adequacy test for insurance liabilities. I need to confirm whether my liabilities are actually high enough. I need to check them. Even though I'm not updating for current, I have to confirm that I have um, sufficient liabilities on my balance sheet. When I'm doing liability adequacy test, I can use the liability adequacy test that was in my original GARP. Remember what I'm doing here is I'm carrying on my original GARP. I'm carrying on accounting the way I originally did. Some of those original GARPs, in fact most of them, had liability adequacy tests. So I can continue to use that liability adequacy test as long as it uses current estimates and it recognizes any loss immediately through profit and loss. 
as long as it does those two things, I can use the test that I was always using in the past. Otherwise, I have to use IS 37, which contains a basic onerous contract test. And hopefully you heard about that on about Tuesday, I guess. So you just use the normal onerous test. So you can see the kind of pattern that's developing here. We've got a standard that we start with, and then we say, but you can do this, and you can do that, and you can do this, and you can do that. You've got all these exceptions to the starting process that allow you to use the original approach that you had. There are some things, as I mentioned earlier, that you're permitted to do as existing practice if you were doing them before, but you may not introduce. Non-discounting of insurance liabilities. If you weren't discounting your insurance liabilities before, you can continue not to discount your insurance liabilities now. I mean, that's really odd. So I've got a really long-dated liability. Okay. If I wasn't, or if I haven't been discounting it in the past, I don't have to discount it now. I don't have to take account of the time value of money. But I'm not allowed to introduce this. So I can't start doing this. If I was previously discounting, I can't now suddenly stop discounting. Off-market measurement of contractual rights, investment management fees, and things like that. Previously, if I was doing it, um, I can continue doing it, but I can't start doing it. Non-uniform accounting policies is an interesting one. <coughs> By saying that insurers all over the world can continue to use their existing criteria, what we said here is if I now consolidate those insurers, if I pull an insurer from Austria together with an insurer from Australia and an insurer from the US, I don't have to change the accounting policies of each of those insurers. I can just kind of add this glob together and have all these different accounting policies operating. Now remember, these are all don't have tos, not don'ts. So that means that if I want to, I can come up with a reasonable policy, but I'm allowed in these circumstances to have different policies. That means, and I guess from a regulatory perspective, you're very seldom looking at cross-border regulation. You're not looking at regulating something outside of your jurisdiction. But we talked two days ago about the idea of consolidated supervision and looking at consolidated companies. It means this is something you'd need to take care of. You might actually have different accounting policies in the same group. You allowed excessive prudence. Um, now, excessive prudence means creating reserves for anything you think about. So if you were previously excessively prudent, you can continue to be. We bought an insurer in 1997. And in South Africa at that stage, all insurers had um, something, had, they were called in, uh, bonus reserves or something like that, but they were secret reserves. You never actually told anybody what those reserves were. And you could over time build up those reserves and they were there in the event of negative circumstances, in the event of guarantees kicking in for low interest rates. You had this extra pool that you could use to pay those, those numbers out. Now South Africa had had a long period of high interest rate, so most insurers in South Africa had very positive numbers. They had very good numbers out there. When we bought this insurer and we delved into their books to do a due diligence, we suddenly discovered they had a negative reserve. So even negative reserves under previous accounting in some jurisdictions, in this case South Africa, a negative reserve was allowed. So there's all kinds of things that can happen when you've got secret reserves, when you've got excessive prudence. Likewise, you can take into account future investment spreads in trying to account for it. Something you can do, you can continue to do if you were doing, but you can't stop doing. Okay, so that's all the weird things. Now we get to a little bit of the normality stuff that's in there. The first one is discretionary participation features. Now, discretionary participation features is a product that banks can't sell because people don't really trust banks that much, but insurers can sell because people ins trust insurers a lot. What is a discretionary participation feature? It's when I sell you a product and say that I will give you a 5% return on this product. But by the way, if I want to, I might give you more. Now, nobody would trust a banker with a product like that. You'd know exactly how much you're getting. You're getting 5%. That's the end of it. But this is a very popular insurance product. And from a commercial sense, insurers know that they need to pay those bonuses, those extra amounts, those discretionary amounts, because that's how they sell future business. So when you look at this, it's very odd in terms of our concepts. In terms of our concepts, we would say something that is not an obligation is not a liability. And what do I have here? I have something where I will decide at my discretion whether I'm going to pay it or not. So it doesn't feel like an obligation. A couple of different ways that people accounted for it. Some people call it a liability. Some people call it an equity. Some people call it a reserve. 
So in essence, the important thing is we've said, and for that, uh, what we've said is where you've got these insurance products, the guaranteed point, the guaranteed amount, the 5%, has to be a liability. There's no question about it. That is a liability. But for the discretionary amount, the discretionary participation feature, we say it can either be a liability or it can be equity, or you can do a reasonable split based on the amount that you expect to pay. You can't show it, though, as something in between. You can't say it's not a liability and it's not an equity. It's quasi-equity, because that creates a new category that people don't necessarily understand. Insurance contracts or insurers also issue investment contracts with DPF. Now, here we broke another one of our rules. We said that we're only dealing with insurance contracts. We're not dealing with insurance entities. But we have said in the circumstances, if you are dealing in these products and you are an insurer, you're allowed to treat these in the same way as you treat your insurance products. And it comes back to that sort of thing that really nobody would trust anybody except an insurer with these products. You wouldn't get these products anywhere else. So that was the logic behind it. So you don't report it under IS-39, um, but the liability, the important thing is the liability can't be less than what you would have reported under 39. So you look first to what my real liability is, then on top of that you decide how you're going to deal with the discretionary amount. So there's plenty of discretionary elements that come into this, plenty of judgments and estimates when you're thinking about insurance contracts, and those become the important things that you have to take into account. Whether this is an insurance contract is one of them, but all of the other measurement bases are equally important in going into it. I said I'd sort of, as perhaps a last point before I finish these, these slides, I wanted to just touch on why this has made things very difficult for us going into the new project. So what I've kind of described for you is IFRS 4 that allows insurer to do, insurers to do a multitude of different things. So insurers might have fair value, they might have amortized cost, they might have amortized cost and fair value. So if I look, I think the next page contains all the kind of models that insurers might have. Current, 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 current with discretionary reserving, cost, cost with OCI or cost, cost. All of those models are allowed under IFRS 4. Now generally that would make it very easy for us to say we have an urgent project in our hands, we need to fix this, we need to make, give insurers a model that is actually consistent across all insurers. But remember what I also said is that because all of these models existed, product development has, or products have developed differently in different countries. Countries with cost, cost, were happy to write higher risk products because that risk didn't throw, flow through as volatility in their earnings. And because we're looking at 50 year products, countries that were doing cost, cost were happy that over the 50 years they would come back to the norm. Over the long period of time that you're looking at, you would come back to some kind of basic norm. So they didn't have to worry about the volatility while they got to that eventual number. Countries that were doing current, current were very worried about their current volatility. So they would write different products that didn't have annual um, volatility, products that actually weren't subject to these. So when we start talking about a new model and we go to some countries and they say, oh, you can't do current, current, it's going to do all this volatility, it's terrible, it's a disaster. You go to other countries and they say, well, we've always been doing current, current. What's the problem? We don't even understand what they're talking about. It's because you've got different products that react differently to different accounting models and those products have developed because they were different accounting models. So there's a sort of a circular argument that happens in this whole process. Any final questions? IFRS 4. Over here. Uh, my question concerns the provisions for uh, only those contracts which are in existence at the moment. Um, uh, let, uh, let us give a simple example of occurred but not reported uh, losses provision. Suppose we take a percentage from the statistical history. So this percentage is not calculated on existing contracts, but we multiply it with the contracts that we now have. And we have some provision, supposing that uh, from these contracts we will have claims. Uh, is this provision considered to be consistent with IFRS 4 or no? Absolutely. If I, think about our, if I think about any, let's start with our basic concepts. And so our basic concepts say a liability is a future obligation that 
exists right now that arises from something I did in the past. What did I do in the past? I signed an insurance contract. Okay. What is the present situation? I think, based on historical knowledge, that something has happened that I don't know about yet. Okay. So all that you're doing when you're calculating that IBNR number, when you're calculating the percentage based on historical, that's your best way of estimating what you think your liability is right now. Will it result in a future outflow of resources? Absolutely. So we're talking about a situation where perhaps I've crashed my car, but I haven't actually reported it yet. I remember yesterday when we talked about impairment, we talked about a divorce and how a divorce affects. And we said, well, I know divorces are happening. I just don't know who's getting divorced. So I can already start to accrue for the effect of divorce. This is precisely the same concept. Thank you. And the question that I uh, raised during the financial instrument uh, that you said we would uh, return to it back uh, when uh, discussing insurance. The equalization reserves that some countries have chosen to show as an equity instrument because it is not allowed to be a provision in IFRS for anymore. Um, so in that circumstance what has happened is I have a situation where I believe I'm making too much profit at this point in time, maybe because the markets are very high or whatever else is happening. And again, it comes back to, I think, some of the points we heard earlier about we assume markets are perfect, but in the back of our heads we know they're not really. So an equalization reserve is very often created in good times in order to have a reserve available for bad times. Now, that's what I said was specifically prohibited. I can't raise a reserve now for things that I don't yet have. So let's, let's think simply about the US at the moment. The US has one year in which they have no hurricanes. Okay. All that hurricane insurance goes to profit. And they have this massive amount of profit that they made in this year. But they know that if this year was a good year for hurricanes, next year might be a bad year for hurricanes. They can't look at next year because those are new contracts under IFRS 4. They're going to write a contract every year, so they can't actually look at what's going to happen next year. They have to look at what's happening this year. So what they will do is they will create a reserve that they put in their equity accounts. So now what I do is I show my equity and I say my equity available for distribution, my equity not available for distribution. And my equity not available for distribution includes that equalization reserve. It includes my way of saying that this income looks like shareholder income, it feels like shareholder income, but it's not really shareholder income because I have to hold it for when the big hurricane season comes but I'll show it in equity, I won't show it in... in um. And remember what I also said about equity, the important thing is IFRS doesn't tell you that you have to split equity. IFRS doesn't stop you from splitting equity. So it leaves it up to you to decide how much additional information you want to give. And what I said about regulators, and sorry gentlemen, you might need to block your ears at this stage, but I said you have within your power as regulators to require that disclosure because it's additional disclosure, you can require it. So you can say to the regulated industry in your particular jurisdiction, you want them to disclose how much of their equity is reserved because of this kind of thing or because of any other thing that you believe might be appropriate reserves. So it's fine to do it as equity, absolutely. With regard to the liability adequacy test, uh, what if the, it shows that uh, the insurer has uh, overestimated the reserves? If this test shows, the result shows that it has more reserves than uh, it should. Effectively, the liability adequacy test says that, and, and bearing in mind, this is only in some jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions have chosen to carry the, they carry the liability in their balance sheet at the original assumptions that they made when they loaded the liability. So they assume, let's say, that nothing changes. The liability adequacy test simply says once a year I need to look at that liability, test it against current assumptions. So it was at original assumptions, I now need to test it at current assumptions. And if the current assumptions tell me the liability is too small, I must make it bigger. If the current assumptions tell me that the liability is too big, I don't have to do anything. It's purely saying, is my liability big enough? Um, now, what that might entail is it might entail that I've taken too much money to profits and I need to take money back out of profits into, um, into my liability. And the way that I would do that is through profit and loss. So I'd show it as a loss. Um, One more question. Um, well, 
With regard to uh, our language, supervisory language, uh, we are speaking about two types of liability that uh, insurance company have. One is technical provision and other liabilities. And for these technical provisions, they are, they are liabilities, but we call them technical provisions. We, re uh, we uh, impose certain rules, certain requirements that these technical provisions must at all times be covered by admissible assets. It is uh, Solvency One regulation. And uh, now my question is the, the following. Um, in, in our cases, in our jurisdiction, we have notified in certain cases that under these other liabilities, the nature of these other liabilities is very similar, almost the same like technical provision. But uh, the insurer has a uh, fine way to recognize this as other liabilities, not as technical provisions, just to uh, skip the legal requirement to have on the asset side admissible assets covering this. So uh, my question is whether there is something about this. Um. Okay, and I'm afraid to say IFRS cannot help you at all. We don't, we don't define technical provisions, which means because we haven't defined it, they, they will be relying on your definition to get it into technical provisions. Uh, we just define liabilities. And so they will calculate the total liability according to us, and then they will take that total liability and split it into technical provisions according to your definition. So sorry about that one. All right. One more question at the back here. Thank you. I just uh, want to say my comment uh, as a regulator, we were not happy to put away all these equalization reserves uh, because when they are in capital, you know that uh, shareholders would like to split it. But uh, I would like to say that these equalization reserves was not, were not um, superficial, they were calculated uh, on some uh, past uh, statistical uh, events and also we, <laughs> must, we can't have any catastrophical uh, reserves which, also, which are also needed and yeah. uh, that's a pity. I, and I, think, I, think, I think that's a very valid point. It comes back to some of the discussions that we had yesterday about the difference between regulatory and accounting. So from an accounting perspective, trying to represent the point in the cycle, if the catastrophe hasn't happened, the catastrophe is effectively an unexpected loss, like we spoke about in impairment. But it, it again goes to exactly the points that we're talking about, how important it is to know where you start as a regulator when you're looking at accounting, but how equally important it is to understand that there are times when you need to adjust the accounting numbers. Your objectives as, as a prudential regulator are different to our, our objectives. We don't want to account for unexpected stuff. You have to account for unexpected stuff. And this catastrophe reserve type of thing is exactly that. It's an unexpected thing. Perfect. Thank you.